through RSVP. Mm -hmm. So I'm just getting everybody joined in. We've still got people um, joining. Hi, everybody who's joining. Just hang with us a moment. We're just getting everybody to join. Okay, um, as they join. Okay, so everybody's good. Right. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good, um, good afternoon and good morning to some of people across the world. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren from Trilogy, and this is Laura, who works with me at Trilogy. We've also got Hi, joining Lauren. us um, Laura from Laura Travel, Sarah Plant from Recruit, Linda Lehart from Vector Placements, Alex Halbrick from Yachty World, and then Sandra um, from the Yacht Purser, who will be co-hosting with me today. Um, but yeah, as I said, we and um, Sandra, do you want to just do a quick intro with yourself? Hi, I'm Sandra, the Yacht Purser, and I have an IAMI accredited training company um, where we teach yacht crew, especially heads of department, captains, purses, how to effectively um, do the administration and the logistics on board. So hi. And um, as I said, I'm Lauren from Trilogy and this is Laura. So Trilogy is, we're also guest um, accredited. We do training here in South Africa. Um, and you know, you know with, with South Africa opening up with international travel, I just thought, you know, so I got so many questions from my students and Sandra, I know you've been questioned, getting a lot of questions. I know that, um, you know, a lot of people aren't sure what's gonna happen now with and what does it mean so that's one of the motivating factors for putting this talk together is to try and give you guys some information um and some you know help on on where we can go so if i can ask everyone just to add their email addresses in the chat please because we will be sending out a recap um just point form um afterwards so if you do want to receive that please just pop your email in the chat also if you can hold questions until the end we are going to do a um email, uh, sorry, Q&A at the end, please include your question and, and who it's for, who you're sort of directing it at, um, so that we can make sure we have that time. And we are going to try and keep it into an hour, and we're going to try and get through everyone, but at the end, I will be putting up information about each individual who's chatting here, so you can contact them directly. So I'm going to start with Laura. Laura is owner of a company called Laura Travel. She's been dealing with a lot of people throughout the lockdown process, um, of repatriation, getting them out of South Africa, etc., and back. So, and she's been working very closely with all the rules and regulations. Um, so, we've been we've asked her to join us. So she's actually joining us from Italy. And um, Laura, I'm going to hand it over to you. Would you just like to tell us what is happening now? Um, what does international travel look like? What does it mean when they say this has opened up for us? Right. So hi everyone, um, please excuse the background, it's not very professional. I'm in my car in an outer strata between uh, Tuscany and the Amalfi Coast, but this is like very good Wi-Fi, so I thought this is where I'll stop and chat. Um, so yeah, what does travel mean at the moment? Um, travel is, uh, is probably more complicated than it was when we were doing repatriation flights, because repatriation flights, we knew exactly what we needed to get ready. At this point in uh, from this of October, they say international flights are opening up, but we still don't know exactly which countries are going to be high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And so we are still waiting for the president to get that information to us. Um, I'll wait that it's next week, but we still don't know where we stand. So although there are schedules showing um, online and everything, we, we, we cannot book those flights until we know exactly where we stand. The other problem is, of course, visa, visas, and I think you, you were going to ask me something about that, Lauren, but I don't know if I should just touch on that now, but there are very few embassies open to do visas at the moment. The one that's visa-friendly and to seafarers especially is the Italian embassy. They, they've been uh, friendly for seafarers for quite some time, and they are open to do visas. And basically, that's the only Schengen country open to do visas at the moment. Um, the USA don't know when they're going to open up yet. And yeah, so bottom line is 1st of October is around the corner and we don't really know yet exactly where we stand. And I just want to stress, um, if anyone's going to know, we would know, but we, we've, we've got all our, I've got my watchdogs watching. Um, for any, uh, you know, for anything to come up, but nothing's come up yet. So hopefully next week we can pick this up again and I'll give you a little bit more information. 
Thanks, Laura. And what about people who are within Europe at the moment? So, you know, obviously we, um, you know, people who are maybe in Europe, can they travel to the US? What's it looking like for people who are already overseas? Okay. So again, it's um, obviously uh, depending on documents and what visas they have. So if they've got a B1, B2 visas, visa, you can definitely tra travel to, to the US if you're a seafarer. Um, so, they, so, I mean, that is still possible. Within Europe, it's definitely possible. I've just flown between uh, Greece and Italy with no hassles at all. Um, you, they don't even, I mean, they actually, bureaucracy says you have to have a COVID test 72 hours before. They didn't even check my COVID test, whether it was done or not done. So what happens logistically within the domestic borders? So once you're in Europe, you can definitely travel around Europe with absolutely no issues. But having said that, there's a lot of media saying that, you know, numbers are climbing, they're going to start restricting and closing borders again. So there's a lot of fear being pushed out there again and um, which upsets me because I don't I don't believe logistically and practically that's actually happening but uh, we have to be aware of it because they could very well now start closing European borders because winter is now arriving or autumn and winter numbers are going up so again um, although you can fly to the US and although you can fly around Europe at this moment in time I don't know what's going to happen next week and the week after that. Okay. And so for people who've got boat papers, um, you know, and who have got jobs or who have got visas at the moment, would they be able to travel um, if they, if, what, what documentation would they need if they wanted to travel? Okay. So you obviously need your valid passport, a valid visa. Definitely a Siemens book always helps. Um, a contract uh, with, with the yacht or the company that you'll be going on uh, work, work, work for would help to have the document on you. But like I said, if you, um, so that would be more for international travel. So when you're actually departing, they may ask those kind of questions and ask to see certain paperwork. But again, logistically, it's more the paperwork we need to give up front to the airline. But literally, when you're at the actual uh, check-in desk, they just want to see that you have the visa and the Siemens book, and, and you're able to travel at this point in time. Um, like I said, South Africa, though, leaving out of South Africa at the moment, we have to just check which countries are considered high risk, medium risk, low risk. Um, we had to get them flight, no problem for seafarers. Actually, it was easier, like I said, because we knew exactly where we stood. But now we don't know where we stand from the 1st of October. And um, the president's going to make some announcement tomorrow, which hopefully will give us some light to this. But yes, you need a valid Schengen visa or if you have a dual citizen passport, that's always a help. Um, so you've got to make sure your visas are, in fact, um, valid. Okay. And, and people with a B1, B2 visa, are the, do you find that people are being able to travel into the States as well? Yes, yes, they are. They, they haven't had any problems during, even during um, lockdown. They haven't had any hassles with the B1, B2 visa. Okay. So for people, for example, there are people who were going to travel over, they've got valid Schengen visas, they haven't got, they're going to look for work on yachts. Um, mm -hmm. Will those people be able to travel at the moment um, or is that still something we're waiting to hear about? Are you saying, is this a question for, for, um, for the USA or is this a question for Europe? Uh, for both. For both. So it depends where they're flying from again. You know, if they're in Europe, they're pretty much safe. If they've got valid visas, they can literally travel to France. Uh, look, France are saying they're not allowing any tourist, tourist uh, sorry, I don't know what that's happening here. Sorry, France are not actually uh, allowing seafarers in for tourist reasons. Um, so that's they they still they still strongly against um, tourism uh, for seafarers. Okay, but having said that, I, I I know people that are flying into Italy, or taking a train from Italy or domestic flight from Italy um, or anywhere, and actually going to France, getting aboard a yacht. They can't actually stop. I mean, I shouldn't be saying this, but they can't actually stop you boarding a yacht. There's nobody actually controlling it. So once you've entered Europe, uh, you pretty much can go find work. Um, the point is, is where you're leaving from decides what paperwork we need. So if you're already in Europe, that's not an issue. If you're flying from South Africa, we have to first work out from the 1st of October, which are the high risk, low risk, medium risk. For example, if Switzerland's considered a low risk, 
you could fly into Switzerland and then from there fly across to France. They probably wouldn't even check at border control because there is no border control within Europe. Um, it's just when you, you've just got to get to the place. And, and that's where we come in, guys. So I, I know it sounds all very general, but there isn't really an answer if it's all. Every passport, every visa, every you know, where your origin and where your destination is, is going to determine what you need. And, and that's what we actually here for. And um, we have enough experience to deal with these kind of things. I mean, we've, I've, I've had 30 years experience in this industry. We also have, um, you know, the embassies at our fingertips, uh, my staff are very, very well trained with this kind of thing as well. So every situation will have a different answer. Okay, thanks. So I really appreciate that. And, and you know, speaking from experience, I know, um, guys, Laura's been helping my, um, myself, my husband who works on yachts, he's a, he's a chef on yachts, and she's been helping him. And I know that your teams work tirelessly to get letters from embassies, by during them in day and, um, you know, and get amazing answers. So, guys, yeah, if, and I'm sure people can contact you, as you say, directly for their individual individual needs. So, yeah, I, I just urge that you do contact us and, and tell us where you want to go to, what paperwork you do have, and, and we will then determine exactly what you need. And we're definitely capable of doing it. Um, if there's a, a world, there's a way. We will find a little avenue to get you where you need to go, even if logistically they say you can't get there, we will get you there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm now in Italy and there's rumors that they might close the borders again, but I'm so confident with my team behind me and that I know I'll get out some way I'll get out so um yeah and that that's the bottom line is that we have the experience to to get you where you need to go wonderful thank you and I know that you've got the contacts with all the embassies um, yes we have the high commissioner on our phone my, my cell number has all the important numbers on it and that also goes with uh, long time in travel so yeah we will definitely do our best wonderful thank you so much Laura. Um, we're going to move on now, Sandra, we're going to move on to Sarah. So I'm going to hand over to Sandra. Oh, um, hi. So um, we're going to be having a chat to Sarah Plant from Recruit, who has one of the best recruitment companies for yachties. And um, yeah, if, if any of you ever have been in Sarah, you'll know she is straight to the point. She <laughs> cuts to the chase. There's no nonsense. Um, but at the same time, you know exactly where you stand. And, uh, you know, Sarah really does um, know what is going on in terms of the job market. And uh, yeah, so what is the job market doing at the moment, Sarah? <laughs> A million dollar question. The difficulty is we're coming to the end of probably one of the most bizarre seasons ever seen. Um, I have to say, say I've been exceptionally busy. Um, it's been very unusual. I didn't really expect to be. I didn't know what we were going to get. Um, at the moment, it feels very much like a normal autumn. So I've got some boats that are still chartering. I have some boats that have still got owners coming. I've got some owners that will not get off. Um, I have to say some of my larger yachts in the sort of the 70 to 90 range have decided to do an extended yard period, therefore taking themselves out of the game for the winter. And I think some of that motivation has been to just give the world time to find out which way up it is. Because we've, it's almost, we haven't stumbled through the season. It's been very positive in so many ways, but it's been challenging. I think for South African crew, I've managed to rescue one of my lads, but it took me four months to get him out of South Africa. Um, I put him for, for, first forward to the boat in May. They ended up taking a different crew member. That crew member didn't work out. He wasn't mine. <laughs> and in the end, I said, come on, he's in there. He'll put himself on a plane. And I had no idea how he actually got there. But he managed to get into France and join the boat. And he's there now. Um, it is a normal win It's a normal autumn. I'm getting jobs, but it's not the same volume as the start of the med season. It never is. So that doesn't feel anything too different. Um, I would say for experienced crew who have jobs in the med, if they can stay where they are and not repatriate home, they would be better to not put themselves through that in case borders are locked down. Nobody knows what's going to happen. If they can stay for a period of time and give it some space to work itself out and be local, because I, I also have had some boats that will say, we're not looking at crew with a home destination that is long distance. So South Africans, Kiwis, Australians, and it's partly to do with their, when a hard lockdown came in, crew that were on their leave and their rotation off 
then couldn't leave to get back to the boat and that caused a huge problem for a lot of a lot of crew and a lot of yachts so uh, my youngsters who have it's been their first season i'm saying if you can give it a period of time we've got usually in the usual season we have until really end of november and if boats are leaving they will leave by then um I have quite a lot of my yachts who are not heading to the states uh oh. for all the obvious reasons it, it doesn't seem to be safely managed at some other destinations um some are just going directly to the caribbean some are doing yard periods some are staying in the med um right the volume, well, the volume never, yeah the volume at the end of the med season is never the same as the start yeah um, so that's normal that doesn't feel anything extraordinary um, i'm still getting some great jobs in i've got on some fabulous boats as i always do but it's always now it's, it's not the same volume as the start of the med where every other phone call is a job there's a lot of recruitment it's just it's normal it feels normal more normal um i don't know what everybody else is experiencing but it doesn't feel that this is weighing down the industry too much it's just having to get your head around all the changes and adapting with everything that's gone on um and i think that that's kind of you know because of the uncertainty that's why we're trying to have this chat <laughs> Um, even though there's still more uncertainty, there's not everything that we can cover today. And um, so if you are, if you had to kind of, I think you almost answered it, if you were going to give advice to South African crew members who are in South Africa as to whether they should come over and look for work in Europe, you know, is now the time? I know we're kind of going into the Caribbean season, it's the end of the, end of the European season. You know, what, what would you say to that? I mean, I don't, they even there's there. never, yeah there's never a guarantee anyway but I mean if they're not here if they've got a yachting experience I'd say if they're not here they probably won't be considered because the longer you have to spend in the air then you have to do a 14-day quarantine which we've seemed to have reverted back to because we have the time now it's end of the season some boats have no guests coming so they've gone back to doing the 14 day as opposed to the five-day quarantine you know it's kind of if they're not here it's easier because there are crew that are here, that are local, that will be considered first. But that's the same in any season. Yeah. You know, unless they're looking for something absolutely specific, like a certain qualification or a certain level of experience in a certain thing, like beauty therapy or a nurse, for example, they may consider that person if they're at distance, if they've got that one thing that, they, that the boat is seeking. But I'd say that most crew would need to be in the med to be considered, but there are no guarantees. There's never a guarantee with yachting. Um, but right. I think a lot of boats are avoiding the distance thing or asking to crew to come across on the off chance they may succeed at interview. I mean, obviously a lot's done now on Zoom or on phone as opposed to, well, get them up the gang, you know, get them up the passerelle and we'll trial them because you just can't do that so easily now. Um, right. I think for new crew, it's the same every year i get new crew arriving and they're competing against crew now who are finishing their whole first season and there are always fewer jobs because the med is a very seasonal season you get hundreds of small boats who take two stews and a chef and an extra deck hand may to october all those crew are now becoming available they are local and they will always be chosen first over someone who is just arriving um because there is a, there is less day work to be had the less there's just less work to be had. So the competition is fiercer for fewer jobs. Um, and and now that all the work shows and stuff aren't going ahead, I suppose there's also less, there's less demand for day work and, and you know, just yeah. trying to get the experience as well. Well, we would and, normally be going into Monaco show right now, which obviously, yeah. you know, and you have, we haven't had the build up. There's no day work because there's no show. So yeah. the crew that are here, I'm asking them to give me feedback and saying, you know, what's the feeling like, you know, when you're dock walking, are you getting positive responses? Are you picking up day work? And a lot of them are actually deciding to head home to UK or Sweden or wherever, because having come as first timers, they realize it's very difficult because it just isn't the work for the newbies right now. So I'd say the same for South African crew. If they can, if they can stay home and spend the next few months getting relevant experience, especially interior, if possible, you know, advancing with courses and things like that, then once we go into the next season, sort of March, April, we'll hopefully know a lot more. Travel will be easier. This, you know, the industry will be coming more the right way up and they'll be more positive generally, I think. So, I so think what are, 
I know this wasn't really a question, but it's something that has been asked in a, in a few different groups that I'm in. If you had to give advice to crew right now as to what extra skills they could do that perhaps aren't necessarily the yachting, you know, housekeeping, service, mixology, whatever, you know, what are yachts looking for right now in terms of having secondary or third, you know, tertiary skills? Are we talking That's about good. newbies, new, new crew, juniors? Yeah, so for example, you know, I know Lauren and I have spoken about being able to sew. That is something that maybe a stewardess wouldn't have necessarily thought about going into yachting, but it's a really valuable skill to have on board, especially if you've got a large crew, you know, there's always hems to be taken up and, you know, just yeah, see, things like these skills are huge. I actually placed a stewardess with Lauren many years ago, purely based on the fact that she had a fashion degree and had incredible exactly. skills. So it is, it's, it's an old fashioned thing that you don't even think you're taught in school anymore. So no. it's definitely a string to the bow because the boys are always catching their pockets or, you know, the, the boss's wife will shop till she drops and she's five foot two and she's buying clothes for an Amazon. So there's always the, it's always an additional skill. Like even cooking, helping in the galley. Yeah. It's not just about the food oh. hygiene. It's about knowing order of service in a restaurant. So you yeah. can help with prep, you can help with cleaning, clearing up. It's anything really that's, I mean, working in a hotel and a restaurant gives you a lot of, about, you know, sort of just general order of things. Yeah. So laundry skills are something that's always missing because it's not something you go and do in your holidays. You go and work in a pub or a bar or a restaurant. So the service side and the, and the bar side is definitely a more positive thing. But I don't know what the feeling back home in South Africa is regarding hospitality positions, because I think the world over, obviously, the hospitality industry has suffered. But laundry is definitely, um, you know, sort of laundry, laundry skills are definitely yeah. lacking for nearly everybody that turns up for a first stewardess position. Okay, yeah, that's, that's really good to know. And I know certainly from the deck side, things like carpentry, um, drone flying is re becoming a really big one. I know we've got Captain Dean on the call here. Um, <laughs> you know, um, for them, videography is also probably a big thing. And yeah, so again, you know, just having a look at the jobs and, and what are the extra skills that are coming up and, and trying to see if you can do courses on that, um, you know, that are over and above some of the things that the, the regular yachting courses. All right, well, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I think that was definitely very insightful. And, and I think, you know, just to recap, if you are in South Africa and looking at going over, it's probably not the best time to go right now. I think you might um, find that you're stuck over there with not a lot of jobs and it's expensive and, and might have to come back at some point, so. I think as a newbie, yeah. when you, you're, not, you're yeah. not tried and tested and you haven't experienced the first season. It's very, but it's difficult for all crew. Yeah. But I think with South Africans, it's difficult because you're coming halfway around the world and there are, yeah. There are no guarantees to anything ever. But in the med right. season, at least if you come in March, April, you have no, normally all season to find a job and there's day work that sustains you. Whereas now there's a much less day work because if a boat's going to the yard or they're crossing, they're not going to need detail cleaning or anything else or wash down. So it's, um, yeah, it's difficult this time of year anyway. Okay, great. And then just for the experienced crew, I mean, again, are they finding jobs from South Africa or, you know, I know you said that people, they're looking more for people who are local to avoid those long distance flights. So again, you know, for experienced crew here, is it just a matter of sitting tight, working on your CV, working on your extra skills? Um, yeah, and just, and just keeping the communication flowing, really. I think normally I start sort of employment just into the new year in a normal season. And there are hardly any, there's hardly anyone available because normally everybody's working the winter season or, you know, they're just not, they're not around. So that might actually be to your advantage that you are ready to go. You know where you stand as far as where you can get to, because obviously, as Lara said, everything's evolving. It's very fluid at the moment and every country is at a different point in their rules and regs. So it's July, um, sorry, January to March might be a good time for those experienced crew to find positions that they may otherwise not be considered for purely because they're available. So there right. isn't, I don't want people to lose hope and think, well, that's it. My whole career is over. This is just a moment in time and yachting has survived worse. We have, this is just, yeah. we're off piste at the moment and we're having to roll with it. Everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. But there's always hope. So I think it might actually be to their advantage to be available, ready to go, know what, know where they can get to at that, at that point. Whereas, you know, it's, um, and that's a normal, that's a normal time to be experienced and be available in January to March is a great time. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. And, thanks, um, Sarah. yeah, thanks for that. Okay.
Um, thanks, Sandra. That's great. I think some great information there. Um, right. So next we've got Linda. Linda is based in Fort Lauderdale and um, she is the owner of Effective Placements um, in, for recruitment and she does yachts as well as um, hospitality, high-end hospitality. So Laura, thank you. So Linda, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've obviously got very similar questions for you um, as we do for head for Sarah. What's happening stateside at the moment? What's your feel? What's the feeling over there? Yeah, it's very similar to actually what Sarah was saying. Um, we're finding that um, it is busy. It's very, it's very busy. And um, like Sarah said, I didn't actually expect it. I was quite taken aback to suddenly be getting a steady flow of job orders. I kind of thought it was going to take a bit longer for some reason. Um, and also, you know, here our numbers are so very high and, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of a different way of dealing with things here. But we are finding that um, boats are still operating. They're still, you know, um, you know, guests are staying on board longer, extending their charters, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, it's busy here. But um, it just seems to be, you know, whether, wherever you are in the world, I mean, like in Europe or here, um, the boats are trying to um, hire regionally. Like, you know, the people that are here already have such a big advantage um, over any anybody else. And so many boats are saying, we don't want to fly people in internationally. You know, only look at really just give preference to the crew that are already here. And um, interestingly enough, I've had a lot of crew actually decline jobs because, um, you know, they are on such high demand. So they just said, no, I'd like a little bit more, you know, money. I'd like a little bit more vacation. I'd, you know, so they kind of uh, can pick and choose at the moment if they're here. And, and obviously I'm talking about um, more experienced crew. But um, yeah, they've kind of got like a captive market share. So that's how that's going. The US is a little bit different, I suppose, to Europe and that the US is very much, it's the US, whereas Europe is Italy, France, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a bigger, a bigger captive, you know, catch net, I suppose. So, yeah. you know, what's... Yeah, but we've got boats, you know, like we've got boats up in the Northeast and then we've got, um, you know, here, um, Florida, Bahamas kind of thing. And then we've got um, on the West Coast. So there's a little bit of, um, you know, like the boats, it's, it's got quite busy up in the Northeast. And um, again, those guys are saying, you know, we'll fly people from Florida, but we, we just don't want to fly anyone internationally, you know. And so, so what advice um, do you have for the crew that are in here in South Africa? Both, I mean, it's the starting of the Caribbean season now. Um, you know, are you, is it sort of the start, like you say, it has been busy, but do you find that your season's now, are you sort of ramping up? Would you suggest... Well, come over or what is your advice well like now they've um you know uh re um you know they've got the boat show coming up at the end of the month um and fort lauderdale city and and everyone else is really trying to make that happen clearly it's going to be a whole different landscape for that show with with all the you know um new rules and regulations and everything to do with covid so not really sure how that's all going to play out but um you know the city and everyone is really trying to push to uh, preserve that show and to have um, a big turnout and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be the opportunity there for um, for day work and all of that. But um, like you, you mentioned before, um, it's very difficult for South African crew to go dock walking here. Um, so really the best thing to do is to stay in touch with the agents and to be visiting the agents in the offices and things like that, as opposed to, or in, you know, doing Zoom calls and that, but keeping the communication open as opposed to necessarily um, walking the docks to find day work. You know, um, I think the day work's gonna be there, but um, not necessarily tramping the docks, you know? Because it is a very different way of looking for work in the US as it is to, to med. And, you know, um, as trainers, we often get asked this question as well, is it better to go to the med or to the US to look for jobs? Um, and you know we've we know that in the US you've got to be very careful with that because of the um, you know the, the customs etc so how you know how do crew sort of look at and have you found that people coming in um, sorry I'm extending from that question just is that we've heard of people coming sailing and like not even having their documents looked at and then recently um, Sandra and I were talking earlier she was saying she knows somebody who was back officed in customs so you know how is it for, and what advice maybe do you have for crew in, in that regard? You know, um, 
so actually, what is sorry? What is the question in in terms sorry. of like um, when they're coming into through immigration kind of thing? Yes. Like when they're coming how, in the and how do they actually go about looking for a job in in the US? Is okay. So one of the things that I found, um, we see the, a lot of these things as well as pre COVID, but um, so that's where like Lara was saying, everything's so up in the air right now. I don't know what's going to happen in terms of just. Uh, newbies just flying from South Africa straight in here without boat papers and all of that. I don't know how that's going to, you know, work out after October 1st. I have, we have got gr uh, green crew that have come through and I, you know, I don't know if they've got friends who've given them boat papers or what, but we do have a few here. Um, but um, I've always suggested to people not to fly straight into Fort Lauderdale. Um, Fort Lauderdale and Amy seem to be like big red flags for South African crew and they just know they're coming to do yachting. <laughs> so, I always say to them, try and fly through New York or Washington or somewhere else and basically say I'm going to visit family. You know, that's the safest way rather than say I'm going to go to Florida and, you know, visit friends that work on yachts. You know what I mean? You, you know, I'm being very obvious, but, you know, kind of have a, a bit of a different story as opposed to just going straight to Fort Lauderdale. You know, it's, it is a red flag. So. Perfect. Yeah. So what would your advice be for anyone that's looking um, for experienced crew and for, for, for new crew? Well, it, it does echo what Sarah said. If you're in, if you're in the States already, don't, don't be flying out. Like, just stay put um, as much as you can. And as you know, obviously within reason, but um, you definitely have an advantage if you're already here. So if you're experienced crew or, or even a newbie and you're here, you, you do have an advantage. Um, as far as crew that are in South Africa right now with their B1, B2 visas and wanting to fly out of there to, you know, uh, be closer to the job market, I really think that, you know, after 1st of October is really going to be the time to know what to do on that front because, you know, we are getting, we are busy and it, uh, we, we're going to continue to be busy, I believe, um, with people chartering and um, busy, you know, the Caribbean season and all of that. So, um, I think there is going to be there is going to be work to be had, but I really couldn't advise anyone to say you know they should fly out as soon as possible because I just you know I can't um, I don't know how this is all going to evolve. Perfect. But just to stay in touch, clearly, obviously, to be you know con continuously staying in touch with the agents and you know checking in. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I'm just thinking. I think that's that's pretty much everything for we had from you. Is there any um, anything we're talking about extra skills or any other advice that you'd like to give crew who are looking to come for jobs, um, you know, look for work in in the US and Fort Lauderdale? Apart from you know, obviously not flying directly there. <laughs> yeah, I think you know one of the things that I see is um, is I I think um, you know especially polishing up on your resume skills um, is a really important thing um, because sometimes people forego the fact that they can sew, for instance, or that they can do, you know, other things like um, the extra skills that they, they think, well, that's not really relevant. Um, I think that people should, um, you know, try and think about those things and, and uh, market and promote themselves as best they can in their resumes. Um, it is their marketing tool and it's not, an, you know, sometimes people rush them and think, well, I've got everything to do with yachting on here. But, you know, maybe they should think, take the time to really, um, get advice, ask the crew agents if they think that this is optimizing them and take constructive criticism regarding their photos, regarding their, their resumes to sell themselves better, you know? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. We really appreciate your time and oh, you. um, this morning. And yeah, so guys, just to um, recap, very similar to Europe at the moment, where if you're there, stay there. Um, if you're not, this, you know, obviously 1st of October is going to give us more information, but definitely keeping in contact and making sure that you're ready to go and that you are, um, it's good to hear. I think that, you know, the job market is busy and have a, for experience crew, they can pick and choose, I suppose, a little bit, you know, which is, it is quite nice as well. So yeah. yeah. Thanks, Linda. Sandra. Well, thank Hi everyone. All right, and we're going to be having a chat with Alex from Yachty World, and Yachty World supports yacht crew and the businesses that serve them. So if you are on social media and you haven't hashtagged uh, Yachty World, I always say you're not really a yachty yet. So yeah. let's hear it from Alex. Um, what have you heard 
just on the ground from people that you've helped um, in terms of landing a job? Um, you know, what are they, what's their feedback as to, you know, finding, finding a job in this market? Um, this year has definitely been a tough one um, for everybody, I would imagine. Um, and it's opened up some opportunities as well. Um, I, I figured out that there was a need for yachties who were struggling, who didn't know how to get from not knowing anything about the yachting industry to then moving on to doing the courses and then building their personal brand. And then now obviously with travel, they were stuck. So they were prepared, they got that far. And now a lot of yachties are stuck. The ones that were able to go overseas had foreign passports. And I've helped uh, a lot of them kind of get the, their name out there and they have been able to get some good opportunities. Job opportunities, day work, um, mainly in France, uh, Palmer. The States has been a tough one, not a lot going on there. Not a lot of people were able to get to the States and the ones that were there are hired. Um, but yeah, there's, there are a lot of people I'm helping at the moment and still figuring it out as I go, uh, just like them. But basically when they have a question, I do my best to find an answer. And if I don't know an answer, then I find somebody within my network that knows how to answer that question. For instance, um, you Sandra, you're a yacht person and you have a wealth of knowledge which is great. Um, I, may, I would like to ask Captain Dean Pilati if he's available, a couple of questions as well. Um, yeah. Uh, Captain Dean, what, how is it, how's the hiring process been for you so far? Because as a captain, you've, you've been looking for crew and this has been one of the hardest years to hire crew. Sure. I think one of the biggest issues for me is I have a very diverse team and like try and maintain that diversity amongst the crew, which I think is integral to keep the crew very, you know, unique, happy and without getting too many nationalities in the crew mess. And like, um, like was said earlier, the issue we're having now is I have a couple of South Africans that are due holidays and every flight I get them on gets cancelled. And again, it happened last night just before I went to bed, got an email from our travel company saying the flight's being cancelled. We're flying them from America back to Europe to try and get them into South Africa because they're just not taking any flights out of, out of the US back into SA at mm. the moment. And then it's the same with the Australians. You know, we've got full HODs that are costing me ten and a half thousand dollars to get them home, um, then sit in crazy. in quarantine for ten days or two weeks. I mean, they spend four weeks with their family, and then they've got to come back again. You know, so the economics of having Antipodeans on board the boat is is a uh, is a challenge and unfortunately you know and i'm not trying to be mr negativity here but it's just the reality of it I woke mm. up this morning two 80 meter boats in europe have let go 15 crew because mm. and the majority of those unfortunately are south africans and australians because they just can't afford to have hods and heads of departments costing ten thousand dollars each way to fly right. them so yeah, it, it's it's a it's very very challenging. And yes, like Linda said, we look locally because for the obvious reasons. And yeah, and as far as I know, but I can be corrected. Unless you have a signed contract, you will not get into the states at the moment. But that, you know, I have every piece of paperwork under the sun, and I got put through secondary when I flew into Dallas, coming back from the UK from leave. Um, so, you know, that, that is also a, a thing for new crew to be very wary of trying to get into the States without a, without a signed contract. And yeah, a lot and of that, crew, yeah, go yeah, ahead, that's always a thing for the States. I mean, again, you know, it's, it, the, I actually have a student who's, who was back officed and, you know, 
she was married to an American and had all the paperwork to come in based on that. Um, but it is always difficult. So again, America's usually, it is a tricky place, I think, if you are looking for work. Um, it's more people going in there, as you say, with a signed contract. Thank you. And I just want to jump in there quickly. I just see that um, Laura commented there that um, at the moment, and this is one of the reasons I've been working with her as well, is that she only deals with flights that are approved. She only deals with flights that are not going to get cancelled at the moment. They're repatriation flights. So, um, you know, because there are, I know that there were a lot of commercial planes booking flat, flights and then cancelling them. So um, that was just a little message there. Dean, I don't know if that's something that might help you guys in the, in the future as well. And I, and I remember having a, con a conversation with Laura because when I was booking a flight through her and saying, how do I know this isn't going to be cancelled? And her answer to me was, I'm going to hand over to you, Laura. <laughs> Quick yeah. So, I mean, that, that was a huge problem going on because um, commercial, I mean, airlines were still placing normal commercial flights on the system, even though they were, they probably knew they weren't um, government approved or weren't even going to take place. And remember that they were also battling cash flow wise. So I'm pretty certain they were doing it because they were collecting cash flow and then just canceling the flights closer to the time, which is quite unethical, but that's another story. Um, so yes, we, we make absolutely sure we've never had a passenger been left behind. We've never had a pa passenger that hasn't been boarded. Touch wood, not yet. And we've probably repatriated about 900 odd people since lockdown but we definitely check and make sure with our with our contacts with our representatives of the airlines that those flights are actually taking place and when we have representatives that tell us they work for the airline they say lara don't book that flight it's a commercial flight it won't happen but they're still selling seats for it and they know it won't happen but they're selling seats for it. So, and, this, and the reservation staff are, are trained to say, yes, the flight is operating subject to government approval. And the big word is subject to government approval. When the flight gets canceled, they say, yeah, but that flight wasn't, wasn't approved. But they are selling those seats. So Dean, I'm very sorry to hear that most of your um, crew were, you know, couldn't get home. And again, I just want to stress right up until, I mean, we are still repatriating people, even though commercial flights are starting on the 1st of October, we still don't know what commercial flights, but we are still repatriating people this week and next week because the only way to travel back to South Africa or out of South Africa is on repatriation flights. So yeah, just keep stressing. Don't just think because it's now, you know, commercial flights are starting that before the 1st of October, you're able to book flights. It's just not going to happen. So we make sure the flight is government approved first off. We make sure that the clearances are in place to come back to South Africa or that your 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 like like um, Sandra was saying, you need the paperwork in place, the Siemens book needs to be valid. Um, I don't I, again I stress if you're not already in the States, don't fly to the States hoping that you can get through the borders. It's too much of a risk to take. They have sent some passengers back. Um, so if you don't have work, I wouldn't risk it, in my opinion. Um, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who are currently stuck in South Africa, um, do you have any estimation of when will be a good time for them to start heading over? When you say stuck in South Africa, are they South Africans or are South, they... South Africans, yes, who were planning to go overseas, but because of Did COVID, they're... They, they're on hold. So the whole okay, lives so have been put on hold. So they do have work contracts or valid visas and Siemens books and stuff like that? Um, no, people getting started. So people who, like normal, okay. would go to Fort Lauderdale, do the normal okay. crew housing, dock walking, um, so on. Network. It's a problem. If they don't have a visa, it is an issue because, it, you know, like someone just mentioned now that Cape Town Embassy is saying they're only starting non-immigrant visas um, in November. I phoned actually South Africa today and they don't, they, they told me they don't know when they're going to start doing the visa. So, of course, the first element with South African passport holders that they don't hold dual citizenship is they have to first get their valid visa. Mm. Once they've got their valid visa, then they should actually find work. I would really suggest that they find work beforehand. You know, get interviewed on, on team or, or Zoom or get interviewed, get your job, get your contract letter from the captain, um, information about the vessel and the itinerary before they travel. Then we can do, then it'll be easy for us as travel agents to get them on a flight. We can get mm. them on repatriation flights with all those documents in place. But if they don't have um, a valid visa, 
there is no, they're going to be stuck. Which is kind of hard because um, like the traditional way people would do things is go over to the States um, on holiday and wait till they find, they network, they do the dock walking, even though it's not allowed and so on. Yeah, and it's then, difficult times. And now. then they get their boat papers. Uh, so what I have, what I'm trying to do now is to create some sort of way of virtually dock walking. So I'm, I'm working exactly. with crew closely with crew and the results have been great so far. Sisse, who's on here as well, he's just recently joined. So we're going to try and get him up and running um, mm -hmm. and a few others as well. Um, it's been a challenge so far um, because a lot of these people do need visas. Where did you go? Um, I think, you know, Alex, in terms of um, the crew that you already have, you know, your experienced crew that you have contact with, because I mean, I know you just get hundreds of messages every day from crew. Yeah. Um, what, what is the feeling from, from the crew who already are in the industry, who might be between jobs or who might, you know, who have been able to secure a job, you know, as There's you say, a lot you're of... trying to now connect people virtually, which yeah. I think is is how things have gone. I mean, we're all connected virtually right now. Yeah, so it's the new um, normal. How, yeah. How, how do you have tips for people who are wanting to do this virtual networking? Like how, how can they go about that? How do you, how do you do this virtual doc booking? Um, well, you can sign up with the audio world. I can help you take you through the process, but uh, you can also do it the long way around and just look on Instagram, look on Facebook. Um, look at the industry leaders, uh, find them. You can just type in relevant hashtags, hashtag Yali World's a good one, or wh whichever one you want. Um, but just try and reach out to people. People actually do answer their direct messages, even if, if they don't know who you are. And people are, want to help. Um, so if you are, for instance, new to the industry and you have no idea where to start, then the first step is find somebody who knows how to get started or has done it already. Um, what else? It's all about building um, relationships with people. It's all about networking. And because of the online tools, it makes it really easy. So you can essentially go dark walking online and you don't even, you won't get caught by customs or anything if you don't have right views and so on. So you can start preparing now for those in South Africa, you can start preparing now um, check out Yachty World. I've, I mean, the people that I feature, there's industry leaders. Look at Captain Dean Pilati. He, he's probably one of the uh, most famous captains in the industry, I think. Um, and he's built a great crew as well. Also, a whole bunch of leaders there. I think it's great what you've done so far. Um, and what else? I think what's also just important to remember is that, you know, the people who hire crew, it's not yachts who hire crew, it's people who hire crew, exactly. it's captains who hire crew, it's chief stews. So, you know, again, it's, you, you need to remember that most of these people are online somewhere, if it's not on Facebook or Instagram, and we've just also, um, Travis has put LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a fantastic tool as well. It's a more of a professional tool. Just remember, you know, clean up your social media, please. You know, as we've also had a look at, clean up your CV. If you if you not if that's not your skill, if CVs aren't your skill, find somebody who does that. You know, Sandra and make, does it by the way. <laughs> well, I, I, I I I pass that on now. I do that for more of my experience crew. So again, there is actually somebody on here who who does um you know has been helping me with CVs and and you know I've been passing a lot of work onto her. So um mm. you know Chanel Marie is is a good place uh, to tune to as well. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to say also that um, you don't want to harass the people online yeah. because it can be a little bit too much. So you've got to find, you've got to finesse it. You can't just go up straight and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. Because yes, there's yachting, uh, there's boating, both accounts out there as well, which you can follow. Um, I would say just start engaging with them with a like and so on. You will get noticed eventually. And then... Yeah. Also try and go ahead, Dean. Yeah, I just one thing that I think super, super important in this time that's very difficult is don't get beaten up with people saying no. 
Look, we work in an amazing industry. And when you get to it and you get in it, finally, you'll be in it. And don't get depressed or down about the fact that you keep getting knocked back. Just go, it's not me. It's the time. Um, and stay with it. You know, consistency and staying consistent with your job applications and staying within the industry and you'll be rewarded and then you'll be rewarded for your work as well so don't get down about the fact that you can't get out of sa or you can't get to the right places to get a job at the moment just hang tough it'll get better like sarah said we've been through bad times mm. you know the top line of my screen these people have been in this industry a, a long time now and we sort of know we've got you know, there's peaks and troughs with everything. It'll come back, but yeah. don't be downhearted by it and just stay with it. It'll come for those, back. For those stuck in Cape Town, we have, I'll show you the marina here. There's a whole bunch of boats out there. I don't know if you can see them. But that's, what, that's where I first started um, working. And I did it for free. I was like, okay, I have never, never cleaned a, a yacht before. How do I do this? And... I knew I was only going to travel a few months later. So I started working for free. I learned how to use a chamois. I learned how to scrub the teak. I learned how to do a wash down top to bottom. Um, and I was willing to do that for free because I wanted to be paired when I went to the States. And I would recommend that to some of you. A lot of the crew that I've been helping have done the same thing. Yeah, they worked on the boats here. Some of them even uh, became some of them are even permanent crew or temp crew. They, they're getting paid for it, which is great. So there's always, there's always opportunities out there. If you're stuck in Johannesburg, for instance, maybe come down to Cape Town for a little bit or Durban. I don't know what the scene is like in Durban. But there's always something that you can do to prepare yourself for the next step. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alex. And um, I just want to just quickly just reiterate to people if you don't have an american passport or you don't have a green card and you're not legal to work in america it is very tricky going over and dock walking and it's something that you know as um a training provider i can't endorse that and, and we can't say go and do that because you could go over there you could come in on your b2 and three years down the line you could be pulling into st thomas and the immigration officer says oh but you came in on a b2 now you're working on a yacht how what happened and I do know, personally know people who have then been deported, sent back home, and they're not allowed to come into the US again. So always be very, very careful wherever you go that you are, it is actually legal to do that. Okay, so again, I know that the states, we all used to get away with it back in the day, but they are clamping down on that now. So I think it is, again, you know, it is, it is a tricky place to be. You know, I, I do know people have been successful going to St. Martin, for example, and, um, setting themselves up there and, and dock walking and getting on boats. Um, but again, just please, you know, be aware that this, even if you're safe now and you've managed to sneak in one time down the line, they could still look at your record and, and decide to deport you at a later date. All right. Cool. Thanks. Um, sorry, Alex. Um, yeah. Did you have another question? Uh, uh, just again, you know, what advice would you give to crew to make them stand out uh, you know, in, in a crowded job market, are there any particular skills or, I know we have touched on this as well and we've touched on CVs, we've touched on the virtual networking, anything else you want to add? Um, I'd say keep developing way? your personal brand. So educate yourself, um, network with the right people and just, just prepare for, for what you want, prepare for your goals. So I know, first of all, you've got to know what your goal is. And there is a boat out there for everyone. Some people want to work on the massive boat. Some people find that working on a 30 to 40 meter suits them a lot better. Um, that comes with experience though. I would say take the first boat that comes your way, I would say, and it feels right, go for it. Give, give it a try, um, do your best and see where it goes from there. You'll, you'll figure it out as you go. Perfect. And again, if you are in Cape Town, you can also get in touch with Chanel. I know she's been doing some um, some events for Stu's to get their, that service experience in a fast-paced environment as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, Lauren, back to you. Thank you. 
Guys, thanks for that. As you can see, we've got some amazing people, you know, who've, who've come in to give their advice and, and, and like Alex was saying, to connect with, you know, so connect with Sarah, connect with Linda, connect with, um, you know, Laura. I know that Sandra and I also give a lot of our time um, helping people, um, you know, with getting into the industry, giving them advice, as well as doing um, our respective trainings. You know, this is a great time to, to use it this is to get that relevant experience where it's for guys, you know, get some carpentry skills or some things that will help you on deck, um, you know, and get some relevant experience. We're gonna open um, the questions now to the Q&A. So I asked for, for those of you who joined a bit later, I asked that everybody pops their emails in the chat, please, so that we can send you um, a recap of this afterwards. Um, and then we're going to ask, I know that there's been questions that have been popping in here. So if you've got a question, won't you quickly just um, type it in now and we'll go through those and um, we'll ask you to, we'll unmute you and you can ask the person who you want to ask specifically. Okay, so if you have any questions, as I said, go. So Jono, Jono, um, oh, Jono you just put your, your email there. Um, you don't have a question? Anyone who got a question? Um, I had a message come in privately saying, is there a demand for engineers, AV, IT, and ETOs? Um, they do have their AEC, and they also have a mechatronic engineering degree. So, yeah, um, I don't know, Sarah, um, if, you, if you can provide some insight as to ETOs and engineers and uh, <laughs> the demand for those. I definitely, definitely do. It's a very niche position. It's a bit like a purse position. Yeah, you know, it's just there's one on there. There's, a, in a, there's one ETO in a team of say four, five, or plus engineers. But there's always a demand for it. Boats are getting more and more technical. Um, it really depends on whether that person's got yachting experience as well as those other qualifications. Um, but yeah, definitely, I've, I've, I've placed you know I've placed ETOs in my time for sure. Um, is Travis, Travis, you're new to the industry. You have reached out to me before, um, but I, I believe you were going for a deck ETO position. Is that correct? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm new to the industry. I haven't actually um, worked on a yacht before, so uh, I don't have hands on experience. I do have a technical background, so it's more the more the designing and the, the optimization of the engineering processes and all that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's a more like I'm trying to switch into the industry. So that's, that's sort of where I'm at. Um, I would recommend maybe starting out as a deckhand ETO assistant. Um, that way you can learn the way the process of working as an ETO on board or AVIT technician. Um, Captain Dean, have you worked with ETOs before? Would, do you have any input for, for that? Well, like Sarah said, mate, it's just, it's an absolute niche market. And so we're a 60 meter yacht at 1,632 tons. So we're about 75 meters relevant volume we need an ETO, but we just don't have the bed space for them. And, uh, you know, Sarah was exactly right that it's, the boats are becoming more and more technical and yeah, they're just becoming more and more in demand. And I don't think I've even met an ETO that's not on timeshare ever, you know, because that's just the role. It's been a role that the industry has basically created and, and, and taken on and, and run with. But yeah, you're definitely on 75 meters and above, I would think. Yeah. yeah. And ETOs, I mean, we've, we've had ETOs be on rotation, um, you know, and again, there is, in terms of the STCW code, there's the new ETO um, COC, which, you know, maybe that's also a route that you want to have a look at. I actually saw, um, it's, it's mostly on larger yachts that actually need that in terms of their minimum safe manning document. I don't know, Sarah, have you ever placed a, an ETO Heard of one who actually needs the SCCW um, ETO COC? No, because most of the guys yeah. come with additional qualifications. Yeah. They have to have certain modules 
that yeah. the boat will say to me, I need someone who's got Crestron, I need someone who's got mm. this or that. And it's generally those guys have taken themselves out of a technical background and gone and done specific courses pertaining to, you know, that it's not sort of, it's only now becoming a bit more clarified, but I've mm. never really had a boat that says they'd rather have experience over just qualifications. Mm. And it's catch 22 as to whether you wish you do first. Mm. Um, but if you have got a strong, strong ETO background from your shore side life, then you really are better to look at getting more relevant experience or relevant ex you know, qualifications rather than start with an AEC, which honestly my 14 year old could take really. Um, <laughs> because it's a tiny, tiny qualification and it starts you much, much further down the food chain. Whereas if you've got those ETO skills, you just need that opportunity into yachting, you're better to pursue more relevant qualifications along the lines of what list that they're looking for than to start as a deck engineer because it's a much slower process and you won't get the bigger boats looking for a deck engineer generally. Yeah, so so I, I actually I've been in contact with eArmy and they they have said that you can actually get exempt from various courses that um, that go that qualify towards your ETO certificate certificate of competence. So that's what I'm in the process with. It is quite a lengthy process trying to get your NARIC statements and all that um, with regards to getting my degree um, sort of qualified internationally. But I am in the process and it's taking its time. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, again, with, with that, um, the ETO, COC, it's only really much, much larger yachts um, who mm. I think would have that as an actual position that is needed, um, you know, in terms of statutory requirements. Most ETOs on smaller yachts, on like six, I say smaller, like 75 meters, um, again, they just maybe have their um, electrical engineering stuff and their ABIT uh skills and, and certificates and, and that kind of stuff so yeah i think also just have a look into that too. and maybe try and find some etos on faith on facebook on linkedin on these loads on linkedin i know i'm personally connected to lots and just be like hey yeah. tell me what do what do i need to know i mean again serious is crestron you know that that's a There's, very big story. have you heard of just etos um yes i've actually i've linked up what's it Oh no, not that. I, I've been on LinkedIn. There's a couple of groups for, for ETOs and I've literally just been going through like contact lists and adding, just seeing what people are posting and that sort of thing. Okay. Cool. Uh, well, should yeah. we, um, I think yeah. that's um, on lots of information on the ETO. Lauren, do you have? So I've just got, someone's got a question here. Um, Charles wanted to know, he's heard about a B1, B2 issues being issued in Zagreb, Croatia. I'm currently in Croatia and would like to explore the option of possible. Um, Laura, have you heard of any B1B2 um, is with the B1 yeah. issue in Zagreb? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. so, so um, let me just take my camera back on. But yes, um, actually, you can, I've had a situation where a client's actually a German citizen flew to Germany and actually got his B1, B2 visa issued in Germany, but he was a citizen of Germany. So I think in this case, this person that got his Croatian um, B1, B2, well, the B1, B2 visa in Croatia must have been a Croatian citizen, in my opinion, because really the embassies will only help you um, in another country if you have citizenship in that country. So they won't, uh, if you're a South African looking to get a B1, B2 visa, they won't look at you outside of South Africa. You need to get that visa in South Africa. So that's my, that's my knowledge on that. So, um, I could only, yeah. No, I, I've been issued a B1, B2 in, in Germany, and it, it really just also does depend, like if your boat is there and you have a connection to that place, so you can show that um, you need it. Okay, you had work. Okay. So yeah, if you had work, if you had a work contract, um, a lot, that changes everything. So if you have a work contract and you're already in Europe and you can prove that, then that you can even get a Schengen visa in Europe. You can get a lot done in Europe uh, or, uh, you know, you get a lot done if you have a work showing them that you have documentation, a captain's letter, work, and yes. But you can't just get a B1, B2 visa um, just to get a visa to go and then look for work. That's not, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So if you want to unmute yourself and just quickly, um, is that to answer your question, Shaw? Is there anything you'd like to ask more further than that? 
He said there were two South African girls there in split, so she, um, they'll, he'll try to find out what he can do. Yeah. Again, Shah, I mean, you know, it is really tough because a lot of the embassies are closed. So if you know somebody who has done it, um, yeah, best to always get in touch with them. Uh, a lot of the time, it is sometimes who you know <laughs> and um, who, you can know. I, who, can, I just, Sandra, can I just jump in there? So I had um, three crew go to Oslo. Oslo. Um, one was a renewal and two were outright new. So they did theirs did the application, filled it out online, got a date for their appointment, then requested an emergency application and then got issued theirs. Dean, Chef Dean's was just renewed straight out, right? That was no problem. But then two new people only got issued the B2 part of a B1, B2. Um, oh. when, when they were there, they got told that they were gonna get given a C1D and they actually called me from the embassy and then I pointed out to them, well, that won't work because that only allows you for 20 days in the US and then becomes problematic. And so we wouldn't be able to maintain you. So the duty officer at the time understood the situation, realized by talking to me, but let me tell you, you do not get that very often when you go to a US embassy where they call the captain of the boat, get a clearer picture and then issue. But from my experience, the three people that we've sent got them, but didn't get the full B1, B2. They only got half of it because no one's getting an ester. So they can't give the B1 side of, which is the holiday side of the um, B1, B2, but they can give you the working part of it. So, okay. you know, and again, it's different on application and it's who you get on the day honestly yeah yeah just from experience can i can i just add something there just quickly um i, I hear you it's who you get on the day but um, and i'm sure the, the thing is most importantly is give them the documents that they require um with visas Absolutely. it's actually very 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 easy to get a visa um providing you give them the documents that they require so you you can't skip a point you can't hope have wishful thinking you know maybe they'll be nice to me and give me a visa you've just got to give them the documents they require and and then it's very simple from that point on you know um and you're quite right dean i mean the fact that they called you is actually very very <laughs> unusual and very nice and, and yes of course you do get human beings on the other side sometimes that really do want to help but they still need the documents to be correct and just in terms of your so um yeah just the Dean, I think it's the, the B, B1, which is the work on B2 is the holiday part. Um, just for that, there is an actual uh, Customs and Border Patrol handbook, which outlines the fact that yacht crew on private yachts get access, they get a B1 visa. So I always, when I'm writing a letter to the embassy applying for, you know, visas for, for crew, I always try and state that exact little um paragraph in the handbook all right because that's something that they refer to and a lot of the time you know it, it's such a big handbook they might not know every single paragraph and you're like right paragraph whatever it is that's that's what you need to look at and they're like oh yeah okay cool private yacht b1 cool no problem all right it's true. okay yeah it, it's actually funny i flew in through dallas they pulled me into secondary I actually had, and because they're not yacht people, there's no, you know, there's no boats around them. I actually had to explain to them the president's U.S. decrees <laughs> showing that seafarers are exempt. Now, look, and honestly, I just showed empathy towards them. They didn't know it. They don't deal with yacht people flying yeah. through. And, you know, and if you're empathetic to them and stay calm, don't get angry, don't get mad, stay, stay the course and, and, but again, I knew I was right. I knew I had the paperwork, like Laura said, and it's all good, you know? That's yeah. what, you know. It's good advice. 
Yeah, excellent. Thanks. And yeah. just, just want to say one more thing. Sorry, in case I go, <laughs> go off again. Um, I think it's also important there are for the new yachties or the new people that are wanting to get jobs in the yacht industry, get your Siemens book because as a travel yeah. agent, it made yeah. our lives so much easier. I mean, when I had that Siemens book, the embassy is kind of like, it just opened up avenues. So it definitely makes a huge difference having your semen book. Um, and I know that it's a separate application altogether, but remember that when you're getting your visa, get your semen book as well, because um, it really does make life easier. So, and as a purser, I mean, you can't clear into some countries as crew member on a yacht unless you have a Siemens discharge book. You actually have to come in as a guest and then you go on the guest list. And so if you have guests on board and you're only allowed 12 guests, that becomes an issue. So, you know, again, I've, I've cruised all over the world and um, yeah, certain countries absolutely require every single crew member to have a discharge book. And just a quick input there as well, that unless you have a job, you can't apply for a Siemens book, guys. So um, you do need... You do need yacht papers um, or a contract to apply for a South African's a SAMHSA Siemens book here. Um, but and if you do join a yacht, you can apply for the Siemens book of the flag state of that yacht. So um, if you've got somebody who's willing to give you papers, I know there's some people who've never got a job in the industry. And Sarah, I think you'll remember her, Robin. She had a Siemens book, and Sarah, you said to her, "How do you have a Siemens book if you've never had a job before?" Where she was actually given papers by a friend of hers who. You got it, but um, just to let you know, yeah, you do need the contract um, to apply for, for a Siemens discharge book. And if anybody has any questions about applying for that for, through SAMHSA, um, please get in touch with me. I've, 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 we haven't got experience with that, and I'm sure Sandra does as well. So, yeah. Um, I'm just going to move on quickly. Yes, um, Ebony, are you happy that, um, Sa uh, that Laura has, I'm also aware of the time, that Laura has answered your question about um, British passports? Is yes, it? thank you so much. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ebony. Um, and then, Evan, you were asking about regarding traveling to Turkey and looking for work from there. Has anybody got any input about that? Maybe, um, I don't know if, um, I suppose traveling to Turkey would be one thing, but I don't think there's any dock walking. Sarah, yeah? Yeah, if that's as a new crew member, I wouldn't go to Turkey because the whole med season is winding down. Um, it's not really a place that has a main one port that's going to be sort of for dock walking or anything. So if that's a new, if that's a newbie coming into yachting, I would say don't do Turkey. If it's just a transit from one place to another, um, I, I wouldn't have an answer for that. But if it's someone that's looking to come into the industry and base themselves from there, I would say no. I actually had one of my British girls who had family in Turkey and she based herself to look for a first job from there an amazing beauty therapy background and she was refused I put her forward for three jobs and all of them refused her because she was in Turkey and she wasn't in a mainstream place she wasn't in France she wasn't in Britain so and she wasn't you know local in the main part of the Med so um, and that was difficult so okay thank you, thank you very much um, and then I just was um, so checking here, just make sure we haven't missed anybody. Um, so, Susanna, you were saying that you're trying really hard to find your first job in yachts, but it seems so hard. Um, it is hard to get your foot in the door, and I'm sure anyone here who has had their first yacht job, it is, you know. But don't lose hope. And, and like, um, you know, like Alex was saying, it's a lot about marketing yourself, connecting yourself. So, you know, Alex is a great person and a coach for that. Also, You've, you know, you've, you've got a network here already within everybody who's here today. Um, Alex, have you got anything you'd like to add to that quickly? Um, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out and, and make use of my network, please get in touch with me or you can go to yachtyworld.online and, and see what I've been doing for other people. Um, what happened? Sorry, that was me. I'm just sharing a screen. Everybody's... Oh. <laughs> so I thought I thought it just switched off. No, no, no. Um, yeah, pretty much. Just get in touch with me on Instagram or by email. Um, yeah, I'm happy to help you and try and assess your situation and see how we can improve it. Yeah, and um, I just also like to say, um, if anybody wants to email me their resumes um, for an objective opinion, 
I'd be more than happy to help or give advice or do a WhatsApp call. Um, I really like helping newbies get into the industry. So, you know, feel free. Fantastic. Yeah. And take any criticism you have about your CV or, or the work that you need to do just, um, you know, to heart, because again, Linda and Sarah um, have just an immense amount of experience and they know what works and what doesn't. And um, yeah, so if they have, if they require your CV in a certain format, please put it in that format and follow their guidelines as well. All right. Okay. Right. I think um, if you've got any, let's wrap it up. I know people have got places to be and it's, um, we sort of tried to keep to an hour. So thank you everyone from me. Thank you so much for joining. I'm going to hand you over to Sarah. She's going to wrap up. Oh, sorry, Sandra. She's going to wrap up for us. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I wish we could have given you sort of more concrete answers, but, um, you know, I think this year we've all become used to just the ever-changing regulations and rules. So yeah, I think we will need to do to do that follow-up. And just um, you know, if you are in South Africa and you've never worked on a on a boat before, then you know, again, now is probably not the time to be looking to go over uh, anywhere at the moment. Um, and as we've seen, yachts are looking for people who are more in the region already. So again, you know, if you've got a European passport or an American passport. Um, and you can get over there, it might be worthwhile, but at the end of the day, you also don't want to be stuck in a country that could go into another lockdown and then you're stuck there and it's expensive. And that's really what we saw at the beginning of this whole COVID thing is that a lot of people were getting stuck overseas. So again, if you have loads of money and resources behind you and you can get, you know, afford to be stuck somewhere for, for a month or two, then sure, you know, go, go and try your luck. But um, at the end of the day, work on developing your personal brand, work on your CV, work on getting some additional second skills, um, and also reach out to people who, you know, who are wanting to assist you, who can assist you, um, you know. Yeah, so thanks so much, everybody. And um, thanks to all our experts uh, for sharing your time and your your advice and and also to to captain dean i know he was uh wasn't scheduled to speak but again he is just somebody with so much wisdom advice experience and also always willing to help people out too so thank you and thanks lauren for putting this together i think we'll we'll try and maybe do an update once um once we've got more information um i'm obviously we're in contact with Laura. So once we get more information on what's happening with, with after the 1st of October and, and Cyril, who's been ghosting us on, on TV, um, <laughs> you know, more information on what's happening. Um, so yeah, guys, thank you so much for, for all joining in. And we, we really hope that this has been helpful and it's been um, useful for you. As you can see, I've screen shared um, everybody's details there. Please feel free to get in contact with us. I'll, as I said, I will do a recap and everyone who's put their email addresses in, um, I will email you all of that. So thank you so much. And thank you to all our experts for their time. Very much appreciate it. <laughs> if anybody's in Thanks, Cape Darren. Town, um, if anybody's interested in meeting up and I'm trying to get YRTs together and start the small little networking event, I was talking to Sandra about it because she's close by. Um, please get in touch. I'd like cool. to see if it's worth making that happen. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, for, for, for setting all of this up. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Really, I hope really, it, was, um, really awesome. it was worthwhile for you guys as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Okay.